This is a hybrid cargo passenger ship named Savannah, introduced in 1962. You'll notice straight away there's no funnel belching smoke or exhaust. In fact, this remarkable ship didn't need to refuel, nor did it burn oil in the same way that a conventional ship does. Savannah was nuclear powered, the only nuclear powered passenger ship ever built. To the operators of big ships, the idea of a vessel that would never need refueling during its useful life is an enticing one, and Savannah was built to demonstrate just what this technology could do. But it was only in service for about a decade, and nothing like her was ever built again, so why not? Why, if the Navy can employ large nuclear ships like carriers and submarines, were more atomic merchant vessels and passenger liners ever built? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is what happened to nuclear passenger ships. The 1950s, dawn of the nuclear age. At the end of the war, scientists had demonstrated the terrible power that could be wielded by splitting the atom. Its destructive capacity was obvious, but if that energy could be harnessed, then it could change the world for the better. Until then, the world's largest cities had been fed electricity from big old turbines fed with steam from oil or even coal-fired boilers. So too the big ships, which relied on oil for their propulsion, unless they burned diesel fuel instead. Suddenly there came a new option. Nuclear reactors could use fission to create immense heat, boiling water off into steam and totally removing the need for constantly feeding a boiler with fuel, like oil. As uranium atoms in the nuclear reactor disintegrate, tremendous amounts of heat are generated. When the heat is transferred to a liquid, and the liquid is circulated from the reactor to a boiler room, it can produce steam. Steam drives a generator to produce electricity. And we are building such a unit today, the nation's first full-scale atomic power plant to produce 60,000 kilowatts of useful electricity, enough for a small city. In 1957, the USA's first nuclear power plant went online on shore at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Pretty soon, plants began to spring up across the US, and the benefits were obvious. Nuclear reactors paired to turbines and dynamos could generate immense amounts of power. This was the dawn of the atomic age, an optimistic mind set to work figuring out just how else this new form of power could be put to work. Nuclear power in locomotives, submarines, ships, and even very large airplanes may all but revolutionize future transportation on land, sea, and air. Back in the day, when the liners had been coal-fired, bunkering fresh coal at either end of the Atlantic could take as long as a week. It was back-breaking, dirty, hard work that took a small army of men days and days to fill the bunkers of the big ships with hundreds and hundreds of tons of the coal, all loaded in by hand with buckets. That all changed in the First World War and afterward when ships were converted to burn oil instead. Now, all that needed to happen was for a lighter to come alongside and pump the liquid fuel into the bunkers that might once have held coal instead. But still, refueling was expensive and time consuming. By the 20s and 30s, refueling a big ship didn't take a whole week, but would still take a few days. Now, this was important, because the whole point of ocean liners was to maintain that regular, reliable schedule with as many viable crossings as possible, and a kind of rhythm that would see a ship reach New York from Liverpool or Southampton and begin refueling, taking on fresh food by the ton, and its stewards refreshing the hundreds of cabins and staterooms that needed to take on passengers for the return trip. If shipping companies could cut this time down, then ships could leave after only having arrived two, three, or four days prior. The dream was for a ship to turn around in just one day, something achievable today, but nearly inconceivable 80 years ago. In 1938, for example, Queen Mary could arrive on Monday and depart again on Wednesday. Such was the improvement oil had made for ships' turnaround times. But what if refueling could be eliminated altogether? Nuclear power seemed to offer many benefits aside from refueling cost and time. For one thing, nuclear reactors can generate immense amounts of power without taking up much room at all. In the past, ships' boilers occupied virtually the entire underside of the ship for about two-thirds of its length. The space was one thing, but the weight was another. This arrangement weighed hundreds and hundreds of tons, and needed a small army of men to maintain, significantly less than when boilers were coal-fired, but still large enough that a very good chunk of Queen Mary's 1100 crew were engaged in operating the engines and boilers that gave her that legendary speed. It seemed logical that fitting a reactor into a ship could bring about a new dawn in maritime technology, 
and some great minds might have imagined a future where increasingly bigger ships were powered by bigger reactors. All that was needed was a testbed. Enter NS Savannah. From the outside, observers watching Savannah glide into a namesake port in Georgia might not have seen too much that impressed them. The only thing that gave away the ship's revolutionary power source was the fact that she had no smoking funnel. Instead, her modern, mid-century lines featured a slick, aerodynamic superstructure that loomed over a lengthy forward cargo handling deck. With no need for refueling from dirty oilers, her hull was painted a pristine white. Building her had not exactly been a cheap exercise. At about 13,600 gross registered tons, she'd cost a whopping $47 million. The United States, by contrast, had cost about $30 million more to make, but was about four times bigger. The huge cost of the project was, unsurprisingly, largely down to the reactor and fuel core. It amounted to about 60% of the cost of the entire ship. But so concerned was her design team with safety that many monitoring and crew and passenger safety systems had duplicates and redundancies that raised cost as well. That cost had fallen on the US government, who'd commissioned the ship in the first place to serve as a kind of floating ambassador for a program called Atoms for Peace, just over a decade since atomic weapons had flattened two cities. The United States pledges before you, and therefore before the world, its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. In this capacity, she traveled around the world and received over a million visitors. Her relatively small powertrain arrangement, which had done away with those space-consuming boilers, was ideal for fitting seven large holds down below for cargo. Up top, passengers were housed in the superstructure in the upper hull, where ultra-modern interiors comfortably housed 60. She was an exciting ship, to be sure, but it hadn't all been smooth sailing. The US Naval Institute recorded the recollections of her chief officer, Franklin Schellenbarger, who pointed out that midway through construction, engineers realized that the original proposed location for the bridge was on top of the reactor itself. A neat arrangement, but it would mean there was no access to the reactor and its cooling rods from above. The entire bridge island was moved backward, but in doing so, it covered up the number five cargo hatch and made it virtually useless. Her eventual total cargo capacity was much less than that of her conventionally powered competitors, thanks also to a streamlined, yacht-like hull that made her very pretty from the outside, but difficult to fill up with cargo for the crew. The passenger swimming pool was placed over another hold, making that one difficult to reach as well. Up top, the ship's cargo lifting equipment looked good. It consisted of two sets of trusses and eight 10-ton booms to swing cargo in and down into the ship. In the event, her rig was unconventional, a lighter system that prioritized the rapid loading and unloading of cargo, but was found the system was inadequate when it came to lifting anything considerably heavy, which a more conventional king post and derrick system would have handled with ease. But the worst was yet to come. Captain Schellenbarger recalled that, I was out on the pier one day looking at the draft marks, which weren't just painted on, they were welded in place. I came back to the boatswain and said, Hey, something's wrong. I don't see how it could be. I took the amidship draft marks. They're about seven to eight inches. The forward and aft draft marks look okay. What's wrong? I asked Captain McMichael about it. He said, well, this is one of those stories that isn't well known. It was never publicized and for obvious reasons. When the ship was launched, he rode her down the ways and he said that somebody failed to take into consideration the fact they built the reactor shielding on the vessel roughly amidships, weighing well over 3,000 tons in one spot. When she went down the ways, the stern became waterborne, and the centre of the ship didn't. When it hit the water, the ship sagged something like 18 inches. He said, we thought the ship was going to sink right there in the Delaware. Tugs came alongside. They heard the tremendous crashing of bulkheads buckling, elevator shafts out of alignment. Of course, most of the paint at the time was primer. It was falling off the bulkheads. New York ship had a graving dock ready, because that's where they were planning to move it anyway. They immediately shoved it in, first moving the blocks because of the sag, the delivery of the ship was delayed for two years while they rebuilt. They reduced the sag from 18 to 7 inches, and that is what I was reading on the draft marks in Galveston. Still, despite these issues, performance from the reactor, which fed powerful turbines, was impressive. At 20,000 horsepower, her designers had hoped she'd managed to crack 20 knots. 
but in the event that slick streamlined hull ensured she could blast along at something closer to 24. Her proud operators proclaimed that the response of the power plant in meeting changes in steam demand has been excellent. While it's difficult to compare performance qualitatively with that of a conventional ship, it can be said that the Savannah reactor can meet large changes in load demand in roughly one half to one quarter of the time required for a conventional power plant. On her bridge could be found the very latest in navigational and safety equipment, the first US manufactured reflecting type magnetic compasses, true motion navigational radar systems, and down below the waterline, a set of Sperry anti-roll stabilizers provided less for passenger comfort than for maintaining a stable platform for the reactor. A report refers to the ship as a quote, veritable floating weather station, thanks to the comprehensive suite of weather monitoring equipment and a kind of fax machine that could receive live updates from stations on shore. The Savannah performed well from an operational point of view, said US Coast Guard Inspector Robert Bosnack, but in my opinion, her designers condemned her to a short life by her hybrid design as a passenger cargo vessel Neither function of the ship proved to be economically viable. The Maritime Administration chose not to spend additional monies to convert her to an all-cargo or an all-passenger vessel, but instead removed her from service. I regret that this happened. The ship had been designed with tanks to store about 100 days worth of nuclear wastewater for safe disposal, but it was found that this was totally inadequate, and something of a stain on the vessel's life and purpose as an ambassador for the peaceful and safe use of nuclear power at sea she dumped about 115,000 gallons, or over 435,000 litres of radioactive waste right there into the ocean. In the end, Savannah, despite her groundbreaking propulsion system, wasn't a profitable ship. But, to be entirely fair, she actually wasn't supposed to be. Even at the time of her launch, the public had been told through newsreels that she wasn't expected to be commercially economic. Instead, she was a prototype for what, with more development and experimentation, could be the future of shipping. By that measure then, Savannah was really a success. She did a good job of advertising peaceful uses of atomic energy and she operated for nine years, attracting considerable attention. Where the whole concept began to fall apart was in her running costs. Yes. She did not need regular refueling, so her fuel economy was second to none. But her crew had to be specially trained in handling nuclear plant, and the scientists actually running the reactor were paid better than her deck officers, which led to a union pay dispute. She ended up costing about $2 million more to run per year than an oil-fired competitor. But there's another more demonstrable reason for the failure of nuclear ships to catch on. At the same time Savannah was being finished, the USA was in a standoff with Cuba, Russia about the placement of missile systems close to the US mainland. The tense situation nearly led to a nuclear war and kicked off the height of the Cold War. Citizens of the world's nations from the US to Britain all the way out here to Australia were encouraged to buy fallout shelters for children to hide under desks in the event of a strike that would unleash the power equivalent of tens of thousands of tons of dynamite. The word nuclear began less and less to represent an exciting new age of power and efficiency and became more and more associated with other words like strike, missile, bomb, and apocalypse. In 1961, the SL-1 station exploded and killed three men. And then a few years after that, a Swiss plant melted down after having opened only the year prior. Could the traveling public really feel safe aboard a ship where, just a few stories below their feet, a nuclear reactor was operating? public, sick to death of the nuclear age and all the existential dread it had brought with it would have likely been unwilling customers. Where nuclear power did find a willing customer, however, was in some of the world's big navies. USS Nautilus was America's first nuclear sub, first put to sea in 1955. For military planners, the ability for warships to operate completely independently without the need to refuel was a monumental step forward, especially for submarines armed with nuclear missiles which needed to operate lengthy patrols dictated by Cold War era counter-strike plans. Where specialized skill sets and expensive infrastructure make nuclear ships an unviable option in civilian use, the benefits more than outweighed the costs for naval operators. The added power bonus is extremely beneficial for icebreakers too, who need to harness raw power to crunch their way through heavy ice flows. Only four nuclear-powered cargo ships were ever built, while 13 nuclear icebreakers have been built as recently as 2024. 
Just as Savannah was in service and proving what it could do, the US Defense Department decided instead that conventional oil-fired tankers would be more cost-effective at a time when the Vietnam War's vast expense was beginning to put pressure on the administration and cutbacks were in full swing. In the end, nuclear power at sea on civilian merchant ships brought a whole host of unexpected problems. Not just the cost of actually building and running the things, but the union disputes around pay and training, the liability in the case of an accident which could impact a handful of countries in one fell swoop. That latter point even called into question just how firms could ensure a nuclear-powered vessel at all. Compounding the issue was the fact that some nations like Australia, New Zealand and Japan refused outright to host any nuclear-powered ships at all. In fact, New Zealand still does. Wherever she docked, tugs had to remain poised on standby the entire time, just in case there was an accident and Savannah needed to be whisked out of harbour at a moment's notice. Then came the issue of deactivation. In 1971, Savannah was laid up, her mission done. But where a conventionally powered ship could be simply mothballed awaiting a buyer, Savannah needed near constant inspections and regulation to ensure the safety of that reactor. In 1971, all the fuel had been removed, but the reactor itself was only taken out in 2022 after much preparation and expense. Today, Savannah is a registered National Historic Landmark and a preserved museum ship. She had introduced many firsts and brought about some great successes. Her low enriched uranium reactor was far safer, responsive and more powerful than had been planned. A 1990 report sums it up well. It said that the merchant marine industry's reluctance to develop a fleet of truly commercial nuclear ships no doubt rests heavily with the lack of sufficient federal subsidy. Even with the ground broken by Savannah, private industry was not willing to absorb the costs and risks inherent in this type of research and development. So, while you're unlikely to see a nuclear cruise ship anytime soon, you still actually can visit Savannah in Baltimore, Maryland, where she's occasionally open for limited site visits. You can learn more about these at the NS Savannah Association's website, which I'll link in the description below. So, that's the story of the all-too-brief life of history's first nuclear-powered merchant ship, and why we'll likely not see anything like her again. Sometimes, Unfortunately, technological improvement is hampered by more dull realities. Cost, insurance, labour issues, training, safety, regulation, and even public perception. You could make a nuclear-powered cruise ship today, but in the wake of events like Chernobyl and Fukushima, do you really think passengers would be flocking to get on board? I'm not too sure. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.